So we have been calling the type of publishing that we're engaged in with the Open Textbook Network mission-driven. I'll define that in a few minutes. But the key component here is that mission-driven publishing takes into account everyone along the publishing chain, especially the people who are reading and connecting those readers to the authors. And what we see our role is, is the facilitation of that. And so what we're going to cover today is a sort of philosophical background mixed in with a little bit of history of the development of textbooks and why we're where we are, and some larger picture issues of how to accomplish a more feasible, modern methodology for publishing. I, I hesitate to say necessarily that this is the best model, but at least it gets us to a better place, and I'll explain that in a, in a moment. And then also focusing in on a sort of specifics of how these work. What I'm not going to do is give you the very specifics of this is the documentation you should use, et cetera, et cetera. That's for a larger conversation. So one of the questions that Karen also had was a notion of our role and how we play into all of this. So I'm going to emphasize that and emphasize Scribe's role as a private company that's involved with collaboration and facilitation. We are not the owners of this content, the process. We're not here to in interfere with what you're doing, but also we're here to facilitate, as Elvis has said repeatedly throughout these trainings. Um, and just to clarify, I want to make it clear that Scribe is involved for two reasons here. The first thing is actually more important than the monetary compensation that we're receiving. The first thing is actually this. In this conversation, I'm going to define for you what we call mission-driven publishing. That is, publishing that is driven by a mission as opposed to the business of producing textbooks and the need, so to speak, for textbooks. And what that involves is a dynamic dialectic process in which people are learning from each other on a continuous basis. And as things develop, so too do all the participants. And so more important than the monetary compensation for us is being involved with a community of people who are thinking in a distinctive manner for how to publish and how to solve one of the problems that we're having. And there are two components even within Scribe's relationship. That is, on one hand, we have protected technology and we have protected methodology. On the other hand, we have open concept philosophy and of course, you're the open textbook network. So what I want to mention there is that we are, have, in both the work we do for traditional standard commercial publishers, as well as for university presses, we are always interested in making sure that the knowledge that we have and the ideas that we have are openly available. The only thing we protect is the specific technologies that we've developed. and the content that we produce out of those technologies is always open and always accessible to everyone, and it acts independently of our protected materials. So Scribe Well-Formed Document Workflow, the digital hub, is protected, but any content that's there is not, as well as the processes. Anyone could replicate this if they had enough time and investment in doing so. Um, the other thing is, is that what we're all doing here is sharing a bunch of information. What will become distinctive amongst all of these programs is the written material and what I will later on define as the tradition of imprint identity. And it's important for us to understand that processes and methodologies should be shared and open. And we're all going to have a distinctive approach because we're all dealing with distinctive communities as well as different distinctive subject matter and 
personalities involved in all of these things. And from Scribe's perspective, the shared components are always open as well as all of our documentation and you all have access to that. All right, so let me just uh, give you a little background on Scribe. I think you all know this and we've had this conversation before, but essentially Scribe was started in 1993 to produce post-production electronic publications. And what that means essentially is that people came to Scribe and they hired us to take previously printed materials and turn those into electronically available materials. Initially, that was some learning platforms that were developed by textbook manufacturers, predominantly in the K through 12 field. Uh, our first client in that regard was a company called Facts on File. Now they're called Info-Based Learning. They also, we also had a large presence in the reference and multilingual publishing world. And when we started, what would happen is a very simple process. Everyone's familiar with it. Someone would copy edit a book, usually an in-house copy editor. Then it would be typeset and designed, usually in-house. And then it would be printed, usually by an external printer, warehouse sold, et cetera. Over time, from 1993 to 2004, there was a trend that started to happen. Publishers in the 1950s started to sell their books to places like Barnes & Noble and other bookstores. Then when they started doing that, they lost touch with their particular audience, but they still knew how to sell books because they had promotional materials, et cetera, et cetera. And they would cultivate authors and they would cultivate audience. And they knew that they could bring certain kinds of materials in because they were in touch with who was buying their books. Over time, and kind of hitting a pinnacle of this time in 2004, publishers divorced themselves of the sales and marketing component and they turned more to publicity. They stopped editing books and they turned in-house to project editors who were responsible for hiring freelance copy editors, conveying information to them, and then essentially receiving materials and passing it off to production that was also outsourced. And the pinnacle was reached in 2004 when we saw a large percentage of publishers, in fact, the overwhelming percentage of publishers, moving to an offshore model. And the offshore model was a problem in that what ended up happening is, is that the publishers became completely divorced from the, and here, listen to the terminology here, the product that they were developing. They no longer saw a book as part of a community of people and a conversation that occurred between author and audience, but they saw it as a product to develop and sell. And I'm sure all of you have heard the story about uh, for Charles Dickens and he used to produce his materials and then he would get reactions from the audience and then he would adapt his chapters and fix everything along the way as he was building things. This is a actually typical example of how publishing worked. Sometimes it wasn't done in an episodic manner like Charles Dickens, but if you look at the larger publishing houses like Knopf, Random House, Norton, they started out by cultivating authors and audience simultaneously and by paying great attention to the feedback that they received from their audience and the kind of literature that they developed. Now, even though that's not a textbook environment, what that is is a dialectic. And both audience are brought along in their tastes and development as well as the authors themselves. Fast forward to textbooks, what ended up happening as they were divorcing themselves from this material the publishers ended up doing exactly what the other presses were doing. They ended up 
creating product, sending it to schools, and then they would, of course, charge a lot of money for those textbooks. And they were everything was going on very well until the used textbook market developed. Used textbooks take the money out of the hands of the publishers and puts it into the hand of a secondary market. So the textbook publishers doubled down on their business practices. And what they started to engage in was a twofold thing. One of them was more and more outsourcing, cutting the costs of their production and editorial processes down to a bare minimum. And then what they also did was create an artificial edition. So they would end up being in a situation where they would produce editions of things merely to keep the front run going as much as possible, also artificial. And they would add features to things. We'll get to that in a few minutes, where they would essentially have a situation where they would add features and components to textbooks that were not pedagogically useful, but merely there to create new features, as they called them in their textbook, saying, hey, new in the third edition is this. You need to buy this. By the way, we're cutting the second edition out. You're all familiar with this, yes? Put your hands up if you are, yes, okay. Now, the reason I'm providing this background is not to tell you something that you already know, but is to set the framework for a distinctive method. Um, the other thing that this created was a dilemma that led to the development of the OTN, which is a very simple thing. In textbook production in the commercial situation right now, nobody's winning. Authors are not being paid royalties. They're not part of the process really any longer. The publishers are losing money hand over fist. Students, of course, are not only being built, but many of them are not even purchasing textbooks or reading them any longer, uh, both for financial reasons as well as because the textbooks are no longer useful to them. Um, and then the institutions themselves are getting killed because their textbook sales are down and the money that was generated by that is no longer flowing through to the university. Um, of course, this increase in self-published authors who very often don't do a great job, a lack of relevance of the publishers themselves and the value that they offered decreased, decreased revenue, student anger, decreased revenues to college, horrible cycle of commoditization, and all of these are symptoms of a general problem, which is a very simple thing that textbooks no longer serve their pedagogic function and they no longer work within a learning community. Now, the worst part about that is the very fact that the publishers themselves are disconnected from the subject matter and what they are most concerned about accomplishing is maintaining their revenue. So, two quick sidebars. One of them is library publishing services, um, which in my opinion may be a model for publishing. I guess uh, many of you are involved in these things, so you know better than I do. But the basic idea is this. Library publishing services from my perspective, predominantly started because of the issue of the redundancy of certain components of library services. And a lot of people who were not professional publishers got into offering publishing services for, the, for various reasons. But libraries tend to be highly connected, collaborative environments. And we don't know for sure whether or not this is a, gonna be a sustainable model for publishing. But the notion of a group of people who are there to serve the community, who are connected to the community, and who are producing publications within that community, and who have a kind of finger on the pulse of the pedagogic methodology, as well as the distinctive tone of the university or college, that seems to us to be a much better starting point. Um, the one thing there is that 
now leading to sidebar two is that there is often a lack of professional copy editing and production methodology. And of course, Scribe hopes to provide that kind of framework as well as what we refer to as the back office for doing that. But it is important from a structural sense as well as a pedagogic sense to create consistent, clear material. Copy editing is important because if things aren't edited properly, it essentially creates a stop or a hang in the learning process. And as soon as you do that, the ability to synthesize information becomes difficult for the reader. Um, so we're, what we're in is a mode at the moment for an experimental textbook program. So now this is continuing to be a little bit more background information, but what Scribe noticed was something very interesting. From 2004 to 2014, we noticed a general trend, downward trend in the typical publishing activities. We noticed that a lot of people were not making money in publishing. And we noticed a couple of other things that were going on. Um, by the way, does anyone know in 2014 what the number one selling book in the world was? Oh, it, it's as soon as I say it, everyone's going to go, oh, yeah, and then you're going to have some kind of, someone's typing. Not Harry Potter or Dan Brown, and whoever wrote Beside the Bible in 2014, if you do collectively buy bulls, then yes, this book was sold more, fewer than Bibles, but it sold significantly more books than any one version of the Bible. It was Fifty Shades of Grey. And there were three of them, by the way. Now, you're all laughing, and you all probably think it's smut, and oh my lord, I can't believe he's mentioning this. <laughs> well, let me tell you something about that book. Um, does, of course, Random House acquired it, and they distributed it, and they did a phenomenal job of developing that book, whether you thought it was good literature or not, is an independent issue. What was important about that book is it actually started as what we are now referring to as fan literature. That literature that resonates within a group of people actually comes from that group of people. And if you look at textbooks specifically, they are generated from the pedagogical methodologies of the professional educators that are instituting them. And what's really important about that is that generally speaking, those who are textbook developers, the authors, those folks have been in the classroom for years and years honing their methodology. They say something and students give them blank faces and they know, oh, Maybe that didn't resonate, so they rephrase, or they present in a different outline. And when, you know, getting back to David's talk, when you're thinking about the outlines of these things, it really should resonate with the pedagogical methodology of the classroom and reflect the structure of that. But back to my mission-driven publishing, what we noticed was very interesting, that there were groups of publishers who were doing very well in terms of both the resonance within their communities as well as sales and revenue. Um, and interestingly enough, they all have certain defining characteristics. The biggest one is that they are what we refer to as mission driven. That is, they have a mission and they're driven by that, not merely the revenues. And whether they are universities, colleges, libraries, professional organizations, what they are trying to do is spread ideas within a community, and their focus is on how their publications fit within that community, and creating a dynamic, dialectic integration of those ideas within their community, as well as 
creating a narrative component that reflects the larger conversation that takes place. The longer narrative is the value of a book, and what a textbook does, of course, is provides a structural, synthetically capable body of material that reflects that narrative. Now, mission-driven publishing assumes the tradition of publishing, and what I mean by that is the typical back and forth that goes on between author and audience, and that we become the curators of those activities. We become the ones who make sure that that conversation is a consistent, structured, pedagogically effective methodology. And that what is instrumental in our development of our program is not only maintaining that between the author and the audience, that is the students in this case, but bringing that from one project to another as we all develop. Um, and the idea, whatever we call it, it doesn't matter, but the idea that mission-driven publishing is the idea of making that engagement and that it keeps that going. Now, there's one thing that Karen mentioned before and David said is this notion of imprint identity. Um, in the past, it's, it's interesting. So there's also something else. I, I do this when I'm on airplanes to the annoyance of my fellow passengers. If they're reading, I'll ask them what they're reading, and often they'll tell me, and then I'll ask them who's the author, and they'll usually know that. Then I'll ask them, do you know who the publisher is? Uh, I assume that all of you can name some publishers, so does anyone want to guess who, what the number one answer I get is to who is the publisher of that book? So the number one answer that I get right now is Amazon. Okay. Now, that also seems funny to everyone, but you know, of course, that does not reflect, by the way, the ignorance of the person who's reading the book. Um, that reflects the failure of the publisher to be engaged with the audience and to be connecting the author and the audience. And what that reflects is an entirely anonymous exchange that is not serving the community of people who are reading a book. And so what imprint identity is, is a tradition of, of reflecting that, is developing a tone, design standards, uh, look and feel for your own materials that fit the community and that are consistent. And by the way, so just taking a quick jump to the narrower focus of this conversation, when you design your books, we're gonna provide you templates. We're gonna, of course, give you the structure in SCML and we've given you a name for every element that's in there. But the thing that you're gonna be doing is deploying those templates and making adjustments. And when you're doing that, even in the design as well as the editorial phase, you should be doing that consistently within the structure of your program and consistent to the individual publications that you're doing. Of course, things develop, but they should still fit the general aesthetic. And the reason is, is because all learning is synthetic. And so what I do when I'm presented with something that's new to me is I figure out how to fit that in to my already under, you know, existing understanding. And the book as narrative, when it is consistent, facilitates that. You know, David was talking about the repetition of elements. The reason is not only because people expect that, but because intuitively then they can ingest this material and synthesize it. And if we do things in an inconsistent manner, they not only have to figure out the subject, but they also have to figure out the presentation. And I forget the phrase he used, but that requires a lot of cognitive load, I think is the phrase that he used with respect to that. Um, and so what we're focused on is creating that imprint identity 
not for its own sake, but to create a situation where you are much better at addressing in a pedagogically useful method the needs of the community. Um, and so, the obviously publishing that takes place on college campuses for the express purpose of fulfilling their needs is mission driven, but what I'd like you to take into consideration as you're creating the book is the larger picture of what we're trying to accomplish. That is, yes, we want to professionally design, edit, produce books in a structurally useful manner, and we want to do so in a way that is fiscally responsible as well as hit schedules, et cetera, et cetera. But we also need to do that within the framework of the organization in which we all exist and focus on the mission. Um, now, I'd also like to take a quick other sidebar. Um, the modern textbook designed by committee or edition. So one of the things I'd like to augment David's conversation about is not only when you create the outline and the individual elements, but also looking at the components that are placed within books. For example, charts, graphs, little sidebars, other things that are there. Now, by and large, the books that we've seen so far and the outlines we've seen so far do not have a huge amount of these things. But um, most of the textbooks that you see, if you open up a textbook, contain all kinds of elements that authors have grown to expect in their books. And this is predominantly the result of this addition requirement that I was talking about, which is this notion of, well, we have to put in new features. We have to do more. We have to add features that we can list in our sales report that says, in the third edition of this book, these are new elements. And the modern textbook has become actually a distraction to learning. Every time you take a person's eye, both metaphorically as well as literally, off of the page, and you move them elsewhere, you disconnect them from the narrative of the material. So one of the other things that we should be considering as we're doing all of this is when we're coming up with these elements lists, to realize that many of the elements, for example, tables, charts, graphs, in addition to interfering with accessibility, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, also creates a situation where it's a distraction. So when you're handling your authors and when you're thinking about editing and when you're thinking about your content, one of the things that you should be asking is, are all of these elements pedagogically useful? Are all of the things that we're putting into the book consistent with the way that the course is being taught and the way that the author is thinking about presenting this material, or is this merely an ancillary, and I dare use the word frivolous, component of the book? And the reason for that is twofold. One of them is, again, you're on focusing on the mission of educating students within the subject. The second thing is that each of those components that you add becomes a cost. And so you don't want to be too involved in doing those things. Um, so what do you need to be successful and where does Scribe fit in on all of these things? So my argument is, is that the first thing that anyone needs is the ability to multi-purpose publishing with, publish within a community. By multi-purpose publish, we mean several things. Number one, the content that is being developed should be able to be deployed in any kind of system, be it print, that is what we refer to as a dead tree technology or dead tree system, ebook, EPUB, Mobi, your own learning management software, library produced materials, 
In addition to that, the ability to extract materials and to be able to use the pieces of what you're doing for various things. And so a highly structured environment that provides a nomenclature for those things is very important. Now what Scribe has developed and what we're offering to this is the well-formed document workflow. The well-formed document workflow already has an established nomenclature, a naming system for all the elements in the book, a method for handling those. We have a process that converts materials from one format to another. But that system, which of course is our own creation, isn't the necessity here. What's, what's a necessity is consistent structure, nomenclature, and a methodology of creating that structured content in a way that's what's referred to as nested. That is, all of the elements are contained and consistent with one another in a unit-by-unit -unit basis. That could be within a head structure, within a chapter structure, within a part structure, or within a book structure. Um, and that those things be done in a rigorous way. That is, the structure of content has to be there in order for a textbook to be effective. You have to create a system where the student who is reading the material intuitively synthesizes the content because it is structured in a way that, well, what David said was he was expecting or she was expecting, but the reality is, is that it has its own logic and you pick up on that logic by the visual clues, by the electronic clues that are there. And once you ingest those, you can read the narrative in a consistent way. Now what Scribe has provided is that methodology or an, a methodology. Um, it's well developed and it's been in existence for a long time. So we are already providing that and the training and documentation to do that. Um, the other thing that you need are consistent by dynamic production standards, guidelines, template, documentation. Um, that, of course, we have in our documentation. But if you look at the second uh, section that's denoted by parentheses, I'm sorry, by commas here, the dynamic component is a very important aspect of it. Now, the way we keep our content dynamic is through feedback with you guys. Something's not clear. It is too jargony, it's not hierarchically structured in a way that makes sense to you, you give us feedback on that, we adjust that. The same is gonna happen with you as you deploy these things with your authors. You're gonna say something that seems obvious to you, they're gonna take it in a different way and then you're gonna make adjustments as things go along. So we've provided a framework for that and hopefully Karen has provided the in community and everyone else is a participant in the community for giving feedback and maintaining those things. You are of course welcome to create your own documentation that goes along with that. Uh, the production standards, guidelines, templates are all there for you to either use as they are or adapt as you wish. And all of those you're welcome to use and what, you know, whatever Scribe provides, you're welcome to use and adapt as you wish. The, the one thing we would of course like is to continue to see those things as you're progressing along the way. Um, the third thing, and this is where we have a lot to say and not much time today, is that in our opinion, once you get past the structure, the nomenclature, the actual workflow, you figure all that out and it becomes second nature, of course, to all of you. The most important component is the editing. So, you know, we have style guides, 
we have, of course, the what we refer to as the Bible of style guides, the Chicago Manual of Style. Everyone has their own house style. And if you're developing an imprint, you have certain terminology, certain ideas that get repeated throughout your community that become part of the uh, vernacular of your particular organization. But what's really important is to make sure that as we're doing this, that you're cultivating editors within your organization. And those editors in this particular case can be freelance editors, you could engage Scribe, or you could develop those within your own environment. But at the end of the day, what's important in our opinion is making sure that the editors that you're using are not merely engaged to say, hey, can you copy edit this? You hand it off to them and then they return it to you. What we suggest is that what you're developing are editors who are in touch either literally or metaphorically with your authors and community. That is, they're the ones having the conversation with them, reacting to them, or they're at least getting the feedback from you about what was liked, not liked, what errors they made, what kinds of things that they did that were helpful, and what things that they could improve on based on your feedback to them. Now, doesn't mean that everything that an author says is correct, but it is important for them to be heard. And it's important for the editors to not work in a silo. It's important for them to be engaged in your community or with your community. And by the way, thinking of the future, in the parenthetical statements, so when Scribe does copy editing, all of the copy editing that we do is in-house. And of course, as the CEO of the company, one of the things I have to worry myself about is profit and loss and making sure that we're actually able to pay our employees every two weeks when they get paid. And one of the things that I have found out is that in every instance, having our own editorial staff is actually much more fiscally sound than engaging outsiders. So as you're thinking about developing your publishing program and looking forward to the future, one of the things that I would suggest is that the first place you look to engage people full time is as editors within your organization. Okay, um, so uh, Carla just, seconded that statement. She should be the first person to say that since she's the editor and I am not. Um, but in any case, it's really important to make sure that the materials are crafted like that. And it's much easier to get consistency out of outside staff with design and implementing things like typesetting than it is with editorial. Um, another important component is author management. That is keeping the communication going, making sure you're documenting everything, that you're managing expectations. What Scribe offers, and this is something, especially in the beginning, so managing authors' expectations is a two-way street, also part of that dialectic. Authors have ideas, and you know, one of the things that David was mentioning is when you're sitting down with them, asking them, you know, how does this all fit in? And he Oh, I don't know, he just, he, I'm not glossed over, but he basically said, you know, of course, that assumes that you've already had the conversation pedagogically with the author about what they're trying to accomplish, et cetera. And that's the important thing is to get a sense of what's the author trying to accomplish. And then when they come to you and they want to do certain things of being in a conversation with that author about, hey, how does this meet those goals? Are you sure you want to do this? Let me explain to you how this can negatively or positively affect the publication. Let me explain to you, for example, a table, which is a very common thing for authors to use, actually often, most often anyway, will interfere with comprehension. 
And so that kind of conversation with the author and engaging the author so that we're not merely doing what they ask, but we're accomplishing the goal together is one of the few areas of expertise that Scribe has. You know, discussing with them how you index certain things, what keywords need to be used, what ancillary components might be there, and then helping you guys set those standards as you're working with your authors. Um, the other thing that you need is strong community-based pedagogical standards. And of course, everyone also needs to have a really good understanding of pedagogy. Uh, what Scribe offers in that regard is a sense of structure and accessibility. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but this is something that as a community, I think this is where the strength of the OTN, in my opinion, really lies, or at least the, the potential strength. Textbook publishers are experts in dead pedagogy. If you actually look at the effectiveness of textbooks today that are produced by Cengage and Pearson and everything else, on the whole, their actual effectiveness is down radically from what it was when Scribe started in 1993. And the usefulness to students, in addition to you know students not wanting to spend the money, et cetera, et cetera, the usefulness to students has gone down tremendously as well. And the reason is, is because they have lost touch with the way students learn today. You know, they've tried to create, for example, electronic environments. They've tried to put things into learning management systems. But if you look at what they're doing, all they're doing is regurgitating their dying methodologies into new platforms. And I don't have an answer to this. Um, we've been watching this very carefully, but my hope is that through the OTN, these things are done. Oh, and by the way, so Kathy, when you asked that, um, the, the, there's an organization, um, the TAA, are you familiar with them? It's the Textbook and Academic Author Association, and they produce reports on both sales as well as student use, as well as effectiveness. They publish uh, the gathering and statistical information. Uh, thank you, Karen. They, pa they publish that to their members on an annual basis. And that's done usually in June. And then there are also a couple of people who regularly speak at the TAA who track all of these things as well. Thanks, Karen, for including that. I don't know if any of you are members of this organization, but I'm very fond of them. There are a bunch of authors who are grousing about the current textbook world, but they also are very useful in helping people think about what's going well and what's not going well in textbook publishing. Um, the other thing is about making the author's lack of professional knowledge an asset, not a liability. So it's very interesting there's a joke that we make that very often publishers will use, which is publishing would be great if it weren't for authors. The idea that authors have these expectations that are outrageous and they don't know what they're doing and they interfere with the process and they're always asking us to do certain things. One time we got a manuscript back where after it was very carefully edited, the author put in over a thousand commas and insisted that they be there. Okay, so that's a little outrageous. But at the end of the day, authors are classroom teachers who are pretty connected to their students and who know what work. And so figuring out a methodology for engaging them and learning from them, we would argue is a very big opportunity here for the OTN. And we've been actually engaged in this by asking the authors things like, when you're teaching this, how are you doing this? Forget the textbook, but what's effective in the classroom? How are your students reacting to these ideas? And very often that conversation leads to different ways of structuring textbooks and different methodologies for publishing. Um, 
last two things and then I'm wrapping up. So accessible content. So the first talk today, of course, was what I would refer to as narrow accessibility, and, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. Accessibility, by and large, is about making content available to people who have differing abilities from, say, the theoretically existent perfect reader. Um, but there's a broader sense, which is making content available and understandable. In a narrow sense, what Scribe offers is that our structured approach, as well as the engine that we use to build EPUBs and the engine that we use to generate out HTML, results in accessible content that as long as you do your work with respect to things like alternative in images, et cetera, it results in valid, accessible to current standard um, material. In a broader sense, though, you want your materials to be able to be found as well as readable, that is, accessible in a broad sense. And it turns out that those same things that lead to narrow accessibility by accessibility standards also contribute to broader sense accessibility. That is, highly structured content that is hierarchically presented is a necessity for accessibility, whether it's dealing with a deficit that makes it difficult to read print material, or it's just learning in general. And by the way, um, Tuft was mentioned in the morning session, and I don't know how many of you were familiar him. Put your hands up. Was anyone familiar with him? So Edward Tuft is one of the geniuses of the 20th century in terms of presenting information, especially information in a visual way. The unfortunate thing is that in the 21st century, a lot of his concepts have, while being maintained by designers and people who like him, actually interfere with pedagogy and actually interfere with reading comprehension. And so in addition to the narrow sense of making things accessible and the broad sense of making ex things accessible, we should also be thinking about how to structure information in ways that meet both of those needs. So for example, tables. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, you can look at that and then not to be rude, but once you learn him, you can promptly at least forget the concept of visual display of information that he has brought to the world. His visual displays of information are beautiful, and they are very interesting, but in the modern electronic world, don't function particularly well in an accessible way in both the narrow and broad sense. Um, the interesting thing about that is that it can lead to conversation. Nobody's figured this out yet. I'm part of a board of people that we've been meeting for three years to figure out the next level of accessibility standards and various uses of different things. And there's continuous conversation about this. But that conversation leads to much better publications. And so keeping this in mind, oh, so uh, from Kathy, whoever asked that. So here's the thing, um, and I'm happy to share this. I have an entire bibliography of this, which I will format for you and share that. The only kind of table that works are comparative tables. Um, not only are they not useful in an accessible, narrow sense way, but they are actually function against comprehension. If you have a table where you're comparing elements from each other, and I definitely will send that to you. If you're comparing, say, an iPhone to an Android phone, and you want to say, does it have this feature, this feature, this feature, and you list that in a checkbox fashion, and so you, someone can quickly look and say, oh, all these features are in the iPhone, but they're not in the Android or vice versa, that is an effective table. If you start listing all kinds of different features or you have paragraphs and things like that, it turns out that the list 
is a much more effective method for conveying information and in student learning tends to um, much better result in comprehension of content. Um, so let me get to the last point because I'm running out of time and I was trying to keep this to exactly an hour. Feedback method that facilitates growth and development. So as we're developing our publications program, one of the other things that is exceedingly important is a method for feedback. Feedback from the people who read the books, feedback from the people who produce the books, feedback from people who write the books, in a way that continues all of our growth and development and keeps the OTN going as well as Scribe and the, just the activity of textbook development as well. That it is in that conversation that maybe the current problems with textbook development will be solved. And our hope, of course, is that the OTN is one of those things that pushes textbooks to the next level and to the next generation and is effective. And so we look forward to working with all of you and we really appreciate this opportunity. And we also look for, forward to continuing to learn from all of you hopefully in the years to come. Hopefully this will be a successful program, not merely a pi pilot, and it looks like it's getting off to a great start. Thanks very much. All right, I'm doing my hands. Please join me in thanking David Reck, CEO. And, founder. and thank you all, I'm thanking you as well. <laughs> um, we, we I'll do with a fist bump with Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> We do have four minutes, four precious minutes, um, before I think David has to catch a plane. So um, if you'd like to turn on your microphone or put a question in the chat, <clears throat> either about what he's covered today, um, what you wish he covered, um, please, please do so in the, next, um, in the next few moments. In the next 30 seconds or what? Hi, this is Kathy. And I, with the C uh, with these open textbooks, of course, we want be, people to be able to take a chapter out, take something out, mash things together, and edit it on their own. And uh, I was wondering if using these uh, tools that are in the digital hub and SCML and um, the structure with these with this particular language, um, we can't make that the the tool that they use to edit. We, these are people that are not here. So what, what is the final version of the product that we're going to make that is going to be editable by other people if they want to revise and remix? So if you're using the well-formed document workflow, once you're finished with everything, the tools actually allow you to produce scribe markup language, XML. And from there, we have a process called round tripping. And very often what we'll do when we're doing new additions or what you're referring to as a mashup, I like that. Um, so what we do is we'll take that material and produce that as a round trip word file. And the word file will become the source for the next publication. And it'll have all the images and everything within it so people can take those out? So you can embed the images in it. The answer to that is it can have that. The images tend to interfere in the Word files. So we usually work outside and package the images as a separate container and just mark inside the Word files where they are. But they can be embedded. So okay. Kathy, to add to that, it's essentially you can have the round trip Word file and you can have like the folder full of your images and you'll just have in the Word file the call outs as we've been describing in the training. Um, and you can provide that just openly. Okay. So the, the SAI and the SML are a means to an end to, right. to make it uh, malleable for the outside world. Yeah, okay. correct. Thank you. Other questions? Kathy, were you the same person that was asking about the bibliography? Yes, 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 I need okay, that. Okay, so, so I am actually, Karen mentioned I'm on a plane, so I'm actually traveling this week. What I have is an unformatted bibliography of everything that I have been considering interesting in terms of learning about how we read and ingest information. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to share that. And 
I'm actually refining that because I'm teaching a course this semester at Drexel University on design. And it's not actually visual design so much, but it's design for books and magazines in terms of the larger picture. And so as I work that through, I will make that available.